Okay. Um, good morning, guys, or by you. Good night. Uh, this is our first class in Eretz Yisrael, Baruch Hashem. Uh, I'm in Kafar Haroe. I'm in the uh, neighborhood of the mountain of sight. Bezat Hashem. Uh, hopefully being in the land of Israel is going to infuse the lessons with a lot of life force and a lot of joy, a lot of new energy and faith, and hopefully uh, new chidushim. This is what I was praying for my hippo to do. Um, it's very kadai, the lesson that we're about to learn right now, for a couple of reasons. One, this uh, might be my favorite lesson uh, for a lot of reasons. It also uh was the motivation and the inspiration for the open miracle which i've spoken about now for years regarding my cousin that he got up from his deathbed and he's still um attending dinners for miracle survivors uh every single year um they did research on him after he woke up from his coma um for those who don't know this story, Bezat Hashem, the story will come out during the Torah because this was the whole entire um, impetus for that for that miracle. It was the inspiration I got from this that really gave me the chizik and the strength and the power to pray the most intense prayer I ever prayed. So I'm really hoping, uh, Bezat Hashem, this Torah is just as powerful for you. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this uh, lesson is speaking about the land of Israel um, as the essential point and what the land of Israel represents spiritually, uh, not just physically, and how every single person, regardless of where they live, can, so to speak, live in the land. And through this, uh, hopefully you're going to see uh, miracles in your own life, because this is the lesson of miracles. This is the lesson of prayer. This is the lesson of the truth of truths. This is the lesson of the advice of tzaddikim and how it leads to redemption, how it leads to geulah. Um there's so much going on in this tour. It's so powerful and it's so practical. And I just I just love it. I have a very special connection to this lesson. So I hope you guys love it as much as I do. And uh this will be the first time I've ever learned it in uh Eretz Israel. So uh very special. To begin the lesson, I'm just gonna start with a little bit of a anecdote. That is that there was a very peculiar behavior Rabbi Nachman he had many peculiar behaviors um, or at least seemingly so one of them is that it's documented that whenever anybody asked him where he was going uh, oh right sorry <laughs> uh, this shiur tonight is sponsored by Mr. and Mrs. Shachar Avraham and Bezat Hashem this should help them get to the land of Israel as soon as possible as well I know that they're trying to get here uh, it should be Rafu Shlema for Moshe Asher Ben Malka and uh, for the success of my family in Eretz Israel, apparently. So very nice. Thank you so much. Shem should bless you. The one who blesses should be blessed. So they used to ask Rabbi Nachman where he was going. And instead of us that we say, you know, I'm going to get gasoline. I'm going to get food. I'm going to uh, pick up something for my wife. I'm going to get my kids. His response is always the same. Wherever I'm going, I'm going to the land of Israel. Wherever I'm going... I'm going to Eretz Yisrael. So we see even from this statement, the land of Israel means something much deeper than the physical land for Rabbi Nachman. Because, and I, actually for all Hasidic masters and all Kabbalists, because he lived in Ukraine his whole life. Now, even though there's a well-documented story of Rabbi Nachman's one time that he traveled to the land of Israel, uh, and it's very epic, Bezvet Hashem, one day, Tzion will make a movie about it. He got captured by pirates. He thought he was going to die. He wasn't sure if he was ever going to be able to keep the mitzvot again. He actually started contemplating what he would do if he was in a situation where he didn't have the ability to keep the mitzvot. What mitzvot could he keep? And he had calmed himself down by the time that he had assuaged himself of whatever mitzvot he could keep when he thought about our forefathers that they didn't have the Torah. So anyway, there's a lot to say about Rabbi Nachman in the land of Israel. And hopefully some of that's going to come out right now because I think really uh, the reason why the majority of people who are students of Rabbi Nachman live here um, is not because of the physical land itself. It's not because they're Tzionim, even though they are Tzionim. Um, it's because to a Breslav or Chassid, the land of Israel represents everything in our life that we're looking for. It represents every dream. Uh, it, it represents 
the essence of our faith. It represents um, the goal, the tachlit. So we're going to start with a pasuk from Mishpatim. This is the very first pasuk of the Torah. This is right after we see the, the Torah at Harsinai, just like Shavuot is coming up. And it starts off in a peculiar way. The pasuk says, And these are the laws that you should place before them. So Chazal, the sages, in two different places, they come out with two understandings just from the grammar of the sentence that are peculiar. One is, these are the laws that you should place before them. The first thing that they're uh, into is the fact that it says tasim, you should place. In reality, it says you should teach it, right? Hashem just gave Moshe Rabbeinu the Torah. He's like the Mashiach of the generation. We know he's going to be the Mashiach of the future as well. So he should teach the Torah. Why is it say tasim? You should place it before them like an object uh, or like a dish that you want to serve somebody. So we're going to see one of the reasons in a second. The other thing is lifnehem, before them. It's not a before him or before her. It's before them in the plural, Rabim. So we're going to see that the Gemara says, Masechi Kedushin, Amru Hachaminu Zichunan Livracha, Kedushin Lamed Hei, and Bava Kama uh, Tetvav, Hushvu Ish Le Isha. Men and women are equal. So it's very interesting because when we usually think about equality of men and women, we usually think about modern movements, things that started, let's say, in the 70s. Uh, but in truth, the Torah said thousands of years ago that the perfected state of reality, the one in which we got the Torah in, and the one in which we're looking forward to is when men and women are equal. Now, notice that the Torah says hushfu, they're equal. It doesn't say that they're the same. So this is a very important point, and this goes to one of the fundamentals of the perspective of Torah. That is that one of the reasons why we have tremendous confusion and upheaval in our generation uh, concerns about identity. I know now we can't say men or women in the um, secular world. You have to say them. Uh, you have to ask them how they uh, associate themselves, how they identify themselves. Uh, many people are not sure if they're a man or woman anymore. And there's a tremendous stigma that's placed on raising your kids um, in a way which would appear to lean them towards one or the other without letting your child decide. Um, now, interestingly, the, 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 the Torah, the Midrash says in Mitzrayim, when we had become slaves in Egypt, one of the signaling moments or one of the, so to speak, paradigm shifts that took place for us that was the sign of the tremendous intensity of the Ibud of the slavery, which is primarily psychological, was that Paro gave to the men the job of women. And Paro gave to the women the job of men. So you see something very fascinating because the Torah teaches that in the final exile, the exile will parallel the exile of Mitzrayim thousands of years ago. And we know that Paro is not just a physical person, but he's some type of spiritual force, which his whole purpose is to, to divert your attention from reality, to confuse you, to put you into Bilbu. And what is the siman of this? What is the sign of this, say, Chazal? when the men feel that they're women and the women feel that they're men. So this is just a very fascinating thing. Um, but one of the reasons for the confusion is because we, up to this point, uh, at least in secular society, women have felt undermined. They haven't felt that they have had equality. However, in truth, if you think about it, one of the reasons why a person wants to be like somebody else is because they don't feel good about themselves or at least society doesn't feel good about that person. That's usually the main reason why a person wants to be like somebody else. It's not because they have it better. It's not because they have more advantages. It's because they don't actually feel like they could be themselves. The Torah says that women are nothing like men and men are nothing like women. And anybody who's married or anybody who's, have, who's had a legitimate relationship with the other gender knows that there are differences between men and women. I remember when I was in college, and I grew up very liberal, so I was the first one to, you know, raise the flag for all, all the different um, uh, progressive, so to speak, progressive concepts, including equality of men and women. But when I got to UCLA in California, it was like a whole no other level of liberalism, one that went beyond, I felt, 
seichel, understanding or logic. And I remember there was a girl who literally had a, a debate with me outside of class, um, trying very, very, very hard to help me to understand that men and women are exactly the same. The only reason that we attribute differences to men and women is because society has deemed it so. And because I have something in between their legs that, that she doesn't. <laughs> so I, I remember when she said that comment to me, I had to take a freeze for a second. I didn't even know how to respond because she was so serious. And I was so befuddled by uh, her sincerity. And, um, and I just looked at her, I said, you can't be serious, right? Uh, and I think this, is, this goes to show what Rabbi Nachman says why secular wisdom is so powerful and why it's such a hindrance to faith uh, in the Torah, because it can literally convince you to fight for something which uh, has no substance. It has no reality. Um, it's just, I think it's just very clear and obvious that, that men and women are different and it's okay. Men are no better than women. Women are no better than men. We're both fundamentally necessary. We both have different roles. And, uh, and Rabbi Nachman says, and this is something to look forward to, that when we see men and women as different, like they really are, but equal in their differences, no better or no worse, this is uh, a key to Geula. So we see in some way this is a very interesting phenomenon, because in Hasidut they teach that all of these different, so to speak, movements, they're rooted in emet. They're rooted in truth, but they become misguided because there's no actual anchor and force of Torah. So as a result of that, there is a movement that needs to take place for Geula where men and women become equal. However, because of the lack of Torah knowledge, it becomes distorted and it becomes they're the same as well. And then they don't become equal and they don't become the same. And everyone is just confused. Okay, but what we're going to see in this Torah that the concept of men and women being equal is understanding what it is spiritually to be male and what it is spiritually to be female. As a hint to this, uh, whenever the Torah speaks about male maleness spiritually, it's usually referring to the entity that's called Torah or truth, emet, which we're going to see later in this Torah. Whenever it refers to the female, Rabbi Nachman constantly speaks about this and is trying to bring out the necessity of the female uh, persona to reveal itself in its entirety because this for Rebbe Nachman is the Geula because the female entity within every single person, not just man or woman, is tefillah, is prayer. That this is the utmost, most essential expression of the female quality of the soul. And it's only when that uh, quality is treated like the male quality, when it's equal to it. Meaning, practically, for a Jew, when tefillah and Torah are equal for him, at that point, he's going to experience redemption in his life. He doesn't have a, um, a greater emphasis on learning Torah than he does for doing prayer or hipodadut. And he doesn't have a greater emphasis on hipodadut or tefillah than he does with uh, learning Torah. Like the comment on the bottom, Rabbi Nachman used to say in jest, but he meant it, that the Litvaks, the traditional Jews, they say, learn, learn, learn. And the Hasidim, my great-grandfather, all of his Talmidim, they say, pray, pray, pray. But I uh, am a little bit more open and I think a little more understanding of the redemptive process. And I say, pray, learn, pray, meaning that they're equal, like the, like the Gemara is saying. Now, the Mechilta, which is the other source which Rabbi Nachman brings in the, in the beginning, which seems to have no connection to the first part, which we're going to see Rabbi Nachman explain in a very beautiful, very unique way, uh, it says in the Mechilta, which is a commentary from the sages thousands of years ago on the Torah, specifically in Vayikra, he says it's possible for students to study, but not to be able to understand what they're learning. And this is a big problem because the Torah's whole entire essence is that it's understood. That if the Torah is not understood, it's of no value. So, the sages are saying that when Hashem said, place it before them, Hashem is already, so to speak, um, guiding Moshe towards the unique way in which Torah needs to be taught, as opposed to other types of wisdoms. That is, Talmud Lomer, Asher Tassim Lifneim, place it before them, Achim Lifneim, Keshuchan Aruch. It should be placed before them, spread out like a fully set table on Shabbat. 
This is the source for why the, the Code of Jewish Law is called the Shulchan Aruch. Because what Rav Yosef Cairo did was he took all of the laws of the oral Torah, which is thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of pages of um, back and forth discussion, concession, uh, resolution of the smartest people who ever lived. Um, but you would have to be on that level, so to speak, to know what are the conclusions of the entire Gemara. And the reason why it's so important is because those conclusions are what we live with in our personal lives. This is how we connect to Hashem. This is how we live our personal lives, our communal lives. So comes Rav Yosef Cairo, and he turns it into a Shulchan Aruch. He learns from the Mechilta. The Gemara is not like a fully set table for people. And in order for the redemption to take place, the Torah needs to be like a fully set table. And this is hinting to the times of Mashiach as well, which Rabbi Nachman is going to speak later about. Okay, now we're going to start the Torah. So keep these two things in mind and listen. Da, you should know. Ki ikar hagalut, the essence of exile, collective exile, personal exile, historical exile, sociological exile, psychological exile, spiritual exile, suffering. Eino ella, it's not for any other reason. There's only one reason why a Jew suffers. There's only one reason why people suffer, Rabbi Nachman says. Already you're going to see this is a tremendous chidush because anybody with an open mind knows that there's many reasons why people suffer. However, Rabbi Nachman had a tremendously open mind, but he was just wiser than us. And he says that if you look deep enough, you'll see there's only actually one reason why people suffer. Da ki ikra galu, the essence of exile and suffering, eno ele bishvil, Chesron emuna. There's only one reason why a person suffers in his life, because he lacks a muna, or because he has a lacking in a muna. But what do you mean, mapitom? What are you talking about? There's people that they have life-limiting illnesses. There's people they can't have children. There's people that they're suffering uh, Holocaust-like proportions. Chas v'shalom Hashem should protect us. There's people who are involved in all types of trials and tribulations, abuse, rape, trauma, um, addiction. You can't possibly fathom the things. Me, myself, ending up in a psych ward, having to do uh, electric shock therapy, going through um, tens and tens of psych medications, literally feeling on my last leg that I'm not going to make it and that life's not worth it and I can't go on another day. Rabbi Nachman saying that my problem was not a genetic problem. It was not a uh, sociological problem. It was not any other problem except for one reason, that I lacked emuna, that I did not believe in Hashem. And we're going to see in a moment what is that emuna that I lacked. Because Rabbi Nachman's Chiddush, it's going to be, emuna is not just that you believe in God. It's not even just that you believe that he created the world. Rabbi Nachman is going to say in a moment that the ikr of Amuna is that you believe that Hashem is machadish. We're going to say in a moment what that means. But we're going to see, and this is going to explain why Rabbi Nachman was so makpid on Amuna, because Rabbi Nachman was the greatest av harachaman. He was the father of compassion. He was so empathetic to us. He didn't want us to suffer. And he's saying you're not suffering for the reasons that you think you are. Because the ability for a person to be able to release himself from his ibu, from his servitude, he must know the real reason why. It says in Masechet Brachot, I believe it's Daf Hei Amud Bet, that there was Rabbi Chia was suffering tremendously. Rabbi Yochanan came into his room. These were very, very big tzaddikim. Rabbi Yochanan came to the room. The room lit up. He saw Rabbi Chia uh, crying on the floor. And he came over to him and he said, why are you crying? He said, are you crying because um, you're not, you haven't been able to succeed spiritually as much as you wanted to? You haven't been able to accumulate Torah in your life? He said, no. He said, are you suffering because you have financial problems and you're not able to support yourself or your family? He said, no. He said, are you suffering because you don't have children? And he said, no, I'm suffering because when you pass away, Rabbi Yochanan, there's not going to be anybody beautiful left anymore. So this needs exp explanation. 
Chazal, the sages teach that it was only once the city of Yerushalayim lost men of Amuna. It says there, when there was not one man of Amuna left, when there was not one person left who had real Amuna, which we're going to see in a moment what that means, that is when our exile began. 2,000 years ago, our exile began in truth only because we lacked people who had real Amuna. So what was he crying about? Because he saw that Rabbi Yochanan had real Amuna. Because Rabbi Yochanan took out a bone of his 10th son. He lost 10 of his children. And if any of us can imagine, Chas Shalom, that we should experience the loss of one child, nobody should have to see this. Nobody should ever experience such a thing. Rabbi Yochanan, this tzaddik of the generation, he had 10 children. He lost all of them. He carried around the bone of his 10th child as a reminder to everybody else, says Tosafot and Rashi, that whatever they're crying about is not worth crying about because I'm carrying around the bone of my son to show you that I believe in Hashem and that whether you have spiritual issues or you have financial issues, whether you have issues with your children or your spouse, he's showing the bone and he's saying, do you accept these tribulations with love? Do you believe that Hashem loves you? Do you believe that this is for the best? Do you uh, understand how much char, how much reward, how much benefit is going to come from this? Do you really internalize that and believe that? And he said, no. He said, okay, let me take your hand. And he healed him. And the Gemara says there's something very fascinating. A prisoner cannot release himself from prison. Okay, great. Why do you need the Torah to teach you that? To teach you something that we need to know. That is that Rabbi Chia, like us, needs a very big tzaddik to be able to show us what the true source of our suffering is. Like Rabbi Yochanan was trying to tell Rabbi Chia, it's not what you think it is. It's not because you're physically suffering. It's not because you have health issues. It's not because you have a lack of parnasa or money. It's not because you don't have children. It's not because you're not able to learn as much as you would like to or achieve spiritually as much as you had hoped to. You're suffering because you lack a muna. And when he realized that, he said, okay, now give me your hand. I'll show you how to, how to believe. And this is what Rabbi Nachman is doing for us. And this is the fundamental point. Like the Pasuk says in Shir Hashirim, Tavoi Tashuri, Miro Shamana. The Pasuk in Shir Hashirim, which is speaking about the days of Mashiach, says Rashi, says the Radak. Come and sing on the mountain of Amana. What is it speaking about? So it says in the Yerushami, which is the Gemara from Israel, the one that we usually don't read, it says there that in the future, at the end of the exile, when all the Jewish people are going to be gathered up all across the world, they're going to come back to the land of Israel. But before Mashiach brings us back to wherever we're going to be, he's going to bring us all to one mountain called the mountain of Amana. What's the reason? So Rashi says, because when the Jews return from the exile, they're going to realize it was only beschut, only in merit of their amuna, which brought them this moment of their life. Like when I got off the plane and I kissed the floor and I was crying and I was thinking about how much I had to go through to get to this point in my life. And um, it's unfathomable. It's, it's, it's truly unfathomable. But there's something that developed. There's something that was born out of that darkness. There's something that um, came to life out of that death. There was a phoenix that rose. And it was um, to become a man of Amuna, to become a man of faith, to really believe in Hashem. And this, Rabbi Nachman's going to say, is the key to ending up here. And we're going to see in a moment that the concept of the land of Israel is not just the physical space, but uh, it's a place of supernatural existence. Now, another side note, the Pasuk says, Tavui, come to Shuri, come and sing, Merosh Amana, from the mountain of Amana. Now, two things here. One is that it's, the sages teach that nine songs the Jewish people have sung collectively. The final song is, song is only going to be sung in the days of Mashiach. So it's obviously this song that it's speaking about because we're all going to be on this mountain singing together. Where are we going to be singing? On the mountain of Amana, meaning 
in the place of Amuna. But this word mountain comes from a Rosh, meaning the head of. There's another way to read this. That is that from the Rosh Amana, meaning that amongst the Jewish people, those few soldiers, those few brave uh, as Rabbi Nachman t- calls them, Ish Milcha, Milchama, that man of war or those men of war, those women of war, that they developed real Amuna. They are called the Rosh Amana. They are called, um, so to speak, the head of the Jewish people in terms of Amuna. And because they had become the Rosh Amana, they had excelled in the level of Amuna. As a result of this, all the Jewish people now are coming together to sing on Har Sinai. Meaning to say, it doesn't necessarily mean that we all have to get to the place that we all have a Muna Shlema, but it does mean that in order for us to have Geula, there's going to have to be a collection of individuals, a group. Hopefully it's going to be the students of Zion, that they're going to become the Merosh Amana. They're going to become the head of Amuna for the Jewish people. And as a result of that, we're all going to be coming and singing on this mountain at the end of suffering, at the end of exile, the end of psychological and spiritual, physical, uh, financial, emotional slavery, and the beginning of peace and love and truth and connection, unity and health and all the things that we're looking forward to. So now Rabbi Nachman brings his first Kiddush. The Amuna, hu bechina tefila. Amuna is tefila. Now, this is gonna come and explain something which has befuddled us for so long. Why do I not see the fruit of my labor? Why is it that even though I believe in Hashem, I don't see changes in my life. I don't see transformation in my life. I don't see these things that the tzaddikim speak about. I don't see these things that the Torah talks about. Where is Hashem in my life? So Rabbi Nachman is going to teach you something very deep. Emuna is not a belief. Amuna is not a machshava, it's not a thought that has been, uh, uh, or a core belief that has been internalized in your heart. Amuna is tefillah. Amuna, faith is prayer. Meaning to say that when you are talking to Hashem, you believe in Him. How much does a person believe in Hashem? How much does He speak to Him? This is a very beautiful thing. And this takes away a lot of the um, the questions. This takes away a lot of the confusion regarding faith. Because you have so many shiurim, you have so many classes, you have so many divrei chizuk, so many words of encouragement about faith. And you might feel mamish amped up. You might feel pumped up. Even after this class, you might be like, yeah, like I want to have faith or I have faith. I feel it for a moment. But as soon as you go to sleep and wake up, the day comes, struggles come, difficulties come, where is my faith? And the answer is, you don't have it yet. Because faith is not acquired through knowledge, it's not intellectual. Like Rabbi Nachman says in Sikhot Aran, you want to know who has real faith? Go to children and go to women, Jewish women and Jewish children. You'll see who has real faith. You're going to see constantly Jewish women, even under their breath, saying to Hashem, Hashem, Please help me. I need you right now. Uh, if you see a Jewish woman prayer, pray at the Kotel or at the Kever. You're going to see her crying like a baby. If you see a Jewish child, you see the simplicity of his faith. It's not based on um, any chokhmot, any intelligence, any wisdom, any sophistication. It's simple. You know, my children woke up at uh, 2 o'clock today, which on paper was not the best thing, especially for my wife. It did wake me up, thank God, to be able to give this class. There's the, the good in it. My son came out, and he said he had a bad dream. And he said to my wife, um, Ima, say Shema with me. I had a bad dream. And please pray to Hashem that I have good dreams. So my wife closes her eyes. He closes his eyes. They put their hand over their eyes. and say, Shema Yisrael. Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad. Listen, Israel. Hashem's our God. Everything comes from Hashem. And then they whisper, And my wife said, Hashem, please let Shilochai not have any bad dreams. And then my daughter came in after, probably just because she was copying my, her brother, <laughs> and said, uh, Ima, I had bad dreams. Same thing. But me growing up, and most of us, even now, when we have bad dreams, 
not just when we're sleeping, but when we're alive as well, when we have bad experiences in our life, we have, we have trials and tribulations, is our first inclination to say Shema Yisrael, is our first uh, thought, our first stirring inside of us to go to the field and go ask Hashem for help? Or do we go on Yelp and start looking up doctors? Do we uh, call um, different services? Do we immediately make an appointment with our therapist a month from now? Do we um, pour everything out on people who are not able to handle, contain the pain that we're going through or able to do anything about it? Or is my first thought like Jewish children, like the epitome of the Jewish woman, that I'm going to go talk to Shem about it? And if a person says to themselves, I don't know, I learned Rabbi Nachman's teachings, but I don't feel like my faith is growing. There's only one reason, because you're not talking enough to Hashem. This is as blunt as I can put it. I spent years learning Rabbi Nachman's teachings, and they are phenomenal. They are going to make you think like you never thought. As one of the students of Tzion says, every single lesson is like a paradigm shift. But when does it become actual for you? When men and women become equal for you? That you don't just learn these things, but then you take what you learn and you pray to Hashem about it. I spent years learning these things. And for me, that meant that maleness spiritually was fundamental. But the female quality of my soul was in exile. The lost princess was lost. But as soon as I made a decision, years into learning, when I ended up in the psych ward and I'm sitting on my bed in my slavery pajamas, and I'm sitting there thinking, there's no way I'm going to be able to get out of here unless I actually put into practice that which my tzaddik, my rebbe teaches. That is to talk to Hashem for an hour a day. If in truth, not a little bit, not a lot, but if in reality Hashem controls every single aspect of my life, and the reason I'm here is not because I'm a failure, but because Hashem wants me to be here. The reason why I have such lackings in my life is not because uh, there's something defective in me, it's because I need to take those lackings and turn them into requests to Hashem. That every single point of darkness in my life only is dark because I have not transformed it into a point of conversation with Hashem. But when I have this shift in behavior, not just in thought, and I actually ask Hashem for help with all of these things, and I throw myself on Hashem completely, like Rabbi Nachman teaches in Sikhot Tehran, that the Pasuk in Tehilim, it says, throw yourself on Hashem completely, He is going to um, sustain you. And Rabbi Nachman says, Mamish, when you're struggling, when you have a difficulty, even if it's medical, even if it's physical, Rabbi Nachman says, run to Hashem, throw it on Hashem, because Hashem is the cause of the medical issue. It's not your genetics. It's not what it looks like. And that could be the reason why you're still sick after 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Because the real source of the illness is because Hashem wants you to talk to Him. And if you're going to say, wow, that's so cruel. How could Hashem do that to us? That He would put you in a situation that you're getting sick. And as a result of the sickness, that's the only way I can connect to Him. But this is going to show to what degree we have, so to speak, lost ourselves. You know, if, like it is for me, if you go to a secular Jew, especially one, ones like from my society, you know, it's less with the Sephardic community, but it all depends. And a person suffers from anything. He doesn't think about God. He doesn't think about Hashem. He doesn't think about the source of existence as being the cause of his problem or a place of comfort in which to turn. He immediately turns to people, places, and things. And he could do that for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, calling a million doctors, uh, getting no help, and never once thinking to himself, can you imagine how many hours have I spent seeing doctors? Probably hundreds, if not thousands at this point. Imagine I took one hour of my day, one hour of my life, and I literally just cried to Hashem instead of crying and personally alone when nobody's around and then taking it out on everybody who loves me. And I just pour my heart out and I say, Hashem, I need help. I need to know at least that you're with me, that you're going to help me that it's coming from you and it's not something outside of me. And as soon as you get that answer, your whole life changes and you start to see the blessing in the illness and you start to see the, the cure in the disease because the whole entire reason we're brought to this world is for one reason alone. And that's a Muna and that's tefillah. That's prayer. 
Kamosh Ketuv, like the Pasuk says, the Yehi Adav Emuna. Rabbi Nachman is going to say, where did I get this Chiddush from? This seems like a tremendous novelty because every book I ever learned about Emuna, about faith, it seems to be talking about some type of belief, some type of feeling, some type of thought, some type of intuition, something deep inside of me. And Rabbi Nachman saying, it's not Emuna until it comes out of you through your mouth. So where am I getting that from? Because the Pasuk says in Shamot, Ehi Adav Emuna, Moshe Rabbeinu, the Tzadik Yisod Olam, that when the Jewish people were fighting Amalek, which we know Amalek says the Baal Shem Tov is the archetype of doubt, because the Gematra, the numerical value of Amalek, is that of Safek, it's that of doubts. And we're seeing now what's the cause of all our suffering. It comes from Safek, comes from doubts, and it's clear from Chazal that this is the case, because the sages teach that there's no greater Simcha in the world than the obliteration of doubt. Once a doubt is removed from a person, this is where real simcha comes. What's that called? It's emuna. So when the Jewish people were fighting Amalek, meaning fighting their doubts at a deep internal spiritual level, and at an external level, fighting this actual nation of Amalek, Yoshua ben Nun was leading the way, the Talmud, the student of Moshe Rabbeinu. And what was Moshe doing? Moshe was praying. Where do we know that? It just says his hands were emuna. So that doesn't make any sense. For your hands to be a muna, what does that even mean? So Targum uncle says, Parisan beats low. His hands are spread out in tefillah. And we know that the first time anything is ever said is the essence of that thing. This is the first time a muna comes up in the Torah. How is it used? It's used in regard to hands being spread out in tefillah. That means that the essence of a muna is tefillah. Faith is prayer. Faith is prayer. And you cannot hammer this home enough. You want more faith? Talk more to Hashem. What am I going to talk about? That I don't have faith. How much can I speak about? Until you have it. By promise, if the days accumulate and the hours accumulate and the depth of your heart is revealed as time goes on more and more to Hashem, you speak to Hashem like He's your best friend, like Rabbi Nachman says too, like He... Um, continues to encourage us every single day to do this, not to give up on this, that this is primary, even over learning Torah, and Torah will eventually come from this, that this needs to be the number one fundamental thing, then you're going to believe. You know, people sometimes, they see Breslov or Hasidim, and they're like, some people are in awe of their actions because they make decisions which seemingly uh, don't have logical basis <laughs> behind them, but it's really not that. It's it's the fact that uh, a Breslov or Chassid, a real student of Rabbi Nachman, his amun is so real for him. Like right now I see it's dark outside. Yeah. So that's my reality. A person with amuna, it's light outside. Because for him, darkness and light is one thing. Suffering and pleasure is all coming from Hashem and it's all for the good. So when I make a decision, when that person makes a decision, he's living in a different plane of consciousness. He's living in a different state of reality. Now, when that person's seen by other people, they think this guy's lost his mind. He thinks he's crazy. But there's nothing crazy about him. He just has faith. He just has a muna. For him, it's not theoretical faith. For the majority of Jewish people, you know, I'm just being honest, faith is theoretical. And this is the cause, Rabbi Nachman says, of all of our suffering. When does the theory of faith become actual faith? When you open your mouth and you talk to Hashem. And that could literally be, Rabbi Nachman says, just to speak and say words of faith. That itself is going to bring you to faith. Because the whole mechanism of speech is that it brings, it elicits, it encourages, it cultivates amuna. So here's a special little twist. What do we think tefillah is? Tefillah is, I have requests, or I want to say thank you, and I talk to Hashem. Rabbi Nachman saying that the essence of tefillah and amuna is that you believe in miracles. So already you can see that what is the essence of a breslav or chassid is that for him, everything is a miracle. For him, everything is malam in a tev, not in theory, but in practice. And if that's the case, Rabbi Nachman says, that when I pray to Hashem, it's going to be a very different prayer. Because if I have my job right now because 
Hashem wants me to have this job and I can't get another job because Hashem doesn't want me to have another job. So then where am I going to put the majority and the locus of my efforts? If it's because of, I don't feel like I have a good enough resume, if it's because I think that um, I need more experience, if it's because I think that I just have to um, kind of uh, work at this job for years in order before I move up. So that's what you're going to do. And that's where you're going to put your efforts. But if you believe that this job that you're stuck in is because Hashem wants you to have that job and he doesn't want you to have another one, then who are you going to go to? You know, it's like, for instance, uh, you got up today or tomorrow morning, you have a problem with uh, your, your bank account and you go to the janitor of your building. What is he going to do for you? Nothing. Why are you going to him? Because you think he's the, uh, the source of your answer. But even if you wanted to, he couldn't help you because he's the janitor. He cleans things. He doesn't fix your bank account. So when a person understands that Hashem is the locus of whatever's going on in his life, he's going to turn to him. And the more that a person speaks to Hashem, the more he realizes Hashem exists, the more that he realizes Hashem exists, the sooner he speaks to him. You know, one of my students constantly says, maybe a person who has complete amuna, he would speak to Hashem all day. Maybe he's right. Maybe he's right. I mean, I see myself over the years that my speech to Hashem is becoming so constant and it's becoming um, so natural for me that even when I'm not doing my, so to speak, hour of hipotitut, I'm constantly talking to Hashem. Every single time I have a difficulty, I either thank Hashem or ask Hashem for help. Every single time I make an error, I'll, uh, I'll say, Hashem, you know, I'm sorry about that. Hashem, please help me with this. And you realize as time goes on more and more, oh my gosh, you know, what a different life it is to constantly be in a conversation with the creator of existence than it is never to speak to him. And now we can understand why Rabbi Nachman has a whole entire story about a lost princess. Because a lost princess is your conversation with Hashem. This is the lost princess. And Rabbi Nachman says that the king loves the daughter more than the sons. He loves your prayer more than he loves your Torah learning. He loves when you speak to him uh, deeply and intimately about whatever's going on with you, both about your successes and your failures, your triumphs and your trials, that when you bring it all to him, Hashem loves that. He loves it. It's like his daughter. That The, the story says that he loved her the most and he spent the most time with her. Meaning to say, where is he hovering over? He's hovering over specifically the one who's pouring out his prayer to him. He's the one who gets to see Hashem in his life. And the essence of this prayer is that you believe that Hashem will change your reality. Because tefillah is above nature. The whole concept of prayer is not what you think it is. It's not some basic rote, I get together with 10 men, and, or I say tehillim, and I don't mean what I'm saying. And I do it because it's a mitzvah, it's a chiyuv. Everybody in Chazal comes to teach you, and all the sages, all the Rishonim, all the Achronim say, not like that. You know, the Ramban, who was one of the greatest uh, post scheme of the post scheme, who says it's a mitzvah, they're right to live in the land of Israel. We're going to see that it's actually connected to this uh, inyan of tefillah. He says that if a person doesn't pray to Hashem in a day for what he personally needs outside of his collective prayer, he has not even fulfilled the mitzvah of tefillah. So then the obvious question is, so what am I doing three times a day? Comes the Rambam, right? His contemporary, who we follow, the Shulchan Aruch comes from him, the code of Jewish law comes from him. And he was not a chassid, he was not a mepubal. He was as pashit pashat, as simple as it gets. What is the simple law of the Torah, tefillah? He says that when you come to pray three times a day, that's not tefillah. The Rambam says this. What is it then? He says it's replacing the Korbanot in the Beit HaMikdash. It's replacing the three services that we did in the Beit HaMikdash. It is not substituting for tefillah. So the Ramban says, you're not praying unless you ask for your personal needs. The Rambam says, so if you have the question, what about the three times that I pray with the Minyan? He says, the Rambam even says, that's not tefillah. So what's tefillah? He bodedut, he bodedut. When I talk to Shem about everything that's going on in my life, that's tefillah. And the essence of tefillah is that I'm 
asking for a change of reality. Because Rabbi Nachman says like this, something very beautiful, which is so subtle and so obvious if you think about it. Because the whole essence of nature is that it's necessitating what your life is like right now. Whatever your health is like right now, nature is necessitating that. Whatever your financial situation is right now, nature has necessitated that. Whatever your family dynamic is, nature has necessitated that. Whatever your issue is with your wife or your children or your lack of wife or your lack of children, Hashem has necessitated that. Or nature has necessitated that. So now what's tefillah? But tefillah mishana hateva. Tefillah changes nature. Right? If I come and I say to Hashem, Hashem, please help me. I don't have enough to pay for the house that my wife really wants. So what are you asking for? You're asking for a miracle. So you're going to say, yeah, but Chazal, the sages teach you shouldn't rely on miracles. But you see from here very clearly, Rabbi Nachman saying, Anais is not what you think it is. Every single time you step to the plate, you get to the batter's box and you ask Hashem, Hashem, please help me with anything. You're asking for a nace, a miracle, which is good, which is fine, because this is the whole essence of tefillah. How do you know you're asking for a miracle? Because teva nature has necessitated that your life is in a way that you don't want it to be. And when you pray for it to be some other way, you're asking for nature to change. What's the whole essence of a miracle? If you look in Webster's Dictionary, you're going to see the changing of nature when the laws of nature are abrogated. That's called the nace. Rabbi Nachman saying, what do you think prayer is? You're asking for a change in nature. This is a miracle. And Rabbi Nachman is coming to bring you a very subtle, very important point. For this, you're going to need a muna. Meaning, you cannot just pray to Hashem and expect a miracle. You need to believe in miracles before you see the miracle. Like I say, uh, that the world teaches you when you see it, you're going to believe it. Rabbi Nachman says, like he often does, the flip. The paradigm shift. That's not the way it works. That is coming from the secular world. But the Torah teaches you that when you believe it, you're going to see it. When you believe in miracles, you'll see miracles. When you demand to see miracles from Hashem, Hashem will show you miracles. When you pray to Hashem weekly without strength, without koach, without feeling, without energy, uh, just kind of blah, 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 talking through it. And I'm putting all of that same effort instead and in getting upset with my wife because she's not treating me a certain way. Instead, I'm getting mad at my kids because they're not acting a certain way. I'm getting upset uh, about my health situation and I'm going to my doctors and I'm asking them, why aren't they helping me? And I'm going from Yelp page to Yelp page for different reviews and calling different people and getting constantly disappointed. So Rabbi Nachman is saying that when you come to pray to Hashem, you better put that same effort. You better put that same intensity of searching, of yearning for a change that you do in the physical world. Just like when you go to work and you are hustling for money, you better put that same hustle into your tefillah because Rabbi Nachman says that that's what creates the nais. It's the koach of the tefillah that comes from your belief in miracles that makes tefillah capable of miracles. Like we often teach that the, when Hashem took the Jews out of Mitzrayim, which we're going to see is very deep and very connected to what we're learning right now, that we're going to see in a little bit that Mitzrayim represents the place where there is no miracles, that it's only Teva. And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu had to leave Mitzrayim when he went to go pray, because we're going to see in a moment that when Paro asked Moshe, please um, pray for me, Moshe said, no problem. I just need to leave the city first. Why do you need to leave Mitzrayim to pray? Because he's going to learn in a second that Mitzrayim is the concept of tzarim, it's the concept of suffering, it's the concept of exile. And in the place of suffering or exile, that's not that's a place of a lack of amuna. And if it's a place of a lack of amuna, I can't pray in that place. Because if I pray from that place, I can't help you, Paro. I can't help the Jewish people. I need to leave Mitzrayim first. I need to leave lack of amuna behind. I need to enter into a state of amuna before I can get my prayers answered. And what am I be believing in exactly? Here is the Iker, that Hashem is Machadesh, that He says, that there is such a thing as one who's Machadesh. There is an entity in existence, there's an entity in reality, that He renews reality. 
you have the same problem today that you had 10 years ago because Hashem keeps giving it to you, not because it's just happening. You have the same uh, lack of ability to have children, not because you have a genetic problem or your wife has a genetic problem because Hashem continues to close the womb of your wife. But Hashem is machadesh. That means Hashem renews reality. Close your eyes and say Shema to this world. Rabbi Nachman says, how do I have a Muna? Say Shema, close your eyes. Because this world, says the Zohar, is Amad Shikra. It's a world of lies. And where are the lies perceived? Lies are perceived through the eyes. Lies are seen through eyes. How do I get rid of the lies? Close your eyes. <laughs> close your eyes, no more lies. I'm turning into um, Dr. Seuss. That's the delusion that comes from the long flight and the jet lag. <laughs> okay? But Hashem is machadesh, so I can go to sleep now and I can say, Hashem, I'm going to have jet lag for the next month because that's what science dictates. Or I can mamish beg and pray to Hashem that He machadesh, He renews reality for me, that He changes the laws of Teva for me, that Teva has necessitated one thing for me. And I'm asking Hashem to change that for me. Rabbi Nachman is saying that's real tefillah. And when Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu to take the Jews out of Mitzrayim, what did he tell them my name is? Eyer Asher Eyer. I will be what I will be. Now, why is that such a ground uh, shifting, such a uh, mind bending concept that I will be what I'll be? Before that, what was my name to you? My name was God. He's saying, that's not going to help you now. The fact that you believe in me, that you believe that I created the world, that you believe that I'm God, that is not going to help you leave slavery behind. That's not going to help you leave your suffering behind. Because the essence of me being your God is that you believe that I can change your life, that you believe that I can change your conditions and your situation, that I'm above nature, that I'm above Teva. Like when Hashem spoke to Avram for the first time and he took him outside and the Torah says he took him chutza. He took him chutza, he took him outside and he said, look up at the stars. And the Midrash says that he took Avram Avinu and he had him have a soul ascent, something which the Baal Shem Tov achieved and the Arizal achieved where he would go up in the spiritual worlds and he showed him the makom, the, the, the shorish, the root of his soul, where it was and how it was so far above the stars, which is connected to the concept of Teva or nature. And he says, you're above nature. You're above Teva. You're not bound by it. The reason why you haven't seen me yet is because you believe in nature. You must first nullify your belief in that and understand I am Elohim. Hashem Hua Elohim. I am the cause of your reality. And you're above it if you believe that. And when you believe in that, I will be that belief for you. This is what he was saying. When you believe in it, you'll see it. I will be what you allow me to be. If you believe in me 25%, I can be that 25% belief for you. If you believe that I exist, but you need a doctor for healing, so I'll exist for you and you'll need a doctor for healing. If you believe that I exist, and I gave you the illness, and I can heal you, then that's what it will be for you. Then I will be the one who have given you the affliction. I will be the one who will ultimately heal you. Everything is all in your court. Do you believe? If you believe, you will see. And what does it mean that Hashem is Mechadesh? That He has the ability, it's in His hand, Rabbi Nachman says, to renew any matter he wants according to his desire. Everything is whatever Hashem wants it to be. This is emuna. This is belief. Now, what is the essence of emuna? What is the essence of tefillah? What is the essence of miracles? The ikar emuna bechina tefillah. The essence of emuna, faith the essence of prayer, the essence of miracles. It's not to be found anywhere except for the land of Israel. You cannot get to the essence of faith. You cannot get to the essence of miracles. You can't get to the essence of tefillah except in the land of Israel. And now we can begin to understand <clears throat> why is the whole Torah obsessed with the land of Israel? Why is the whole Torah a story, so to speak, between our journey to and from the land? That the first Jew, we're going to see in a moment, Avram Avinu, 
when he says, I want to be close to you, the Shem says, okay, to be close to me, you're going to have to leave behind where you grew up. You're going to have to leave behind your society. You're going to have to leave behind your father's home. Go to the place that I'm going to show you. And he was speaking about the land of Israel. Why? Why did he need to go to the land of Israel in order to believe in Hashem? Because Rabbi Nachman is teaching that belief in Hashem is called Eretz Yisrael. That the whole entire physical land is actually a manifestation of a spiritual reality that's called the Muna. Eretz Yisrael is Eretz Amuna. It's the place of faith. That when a Jew mamish believes that Hashem is machadish, that he creates and renews reality according to his will at every moment, he's living in the land of Israel. And this is the answer to a very uh, confusing Gemara. I think it's Masech Kedushin. It says there that for a Jew that he lives in the land of Israel, it's like he has a God. And if he lives outside of the land of Israel, it's like he doesn't have a God. So this is a very hard Gemara to understand because if we accept it at say, face value, how can Jews not live here? However, if we understand that in reality, Eretz Israel represents perfected faith, Amuna Shlema, or the perfection of the Tikkun of Tefillah, when I pray with the belief that Hashem is Mechadish, that He renews reality according to His will at every moment, if we understand that that's called Eretz Yisrael, that when I'm in that state of consciousness, I'm praying with that fire, with that fervor, that I'm in the land of Israel, now we can understand. Because up until this point, even though you do have Hashem, it's like you don't have a God. It's like you don't have a benefit to having Hashem. Because the benefit of having Hashem is that He changes your life, is that He changes your reality. But if you do not live in the land of Israel, meaning you don't live in that state of belief that Hashem is machadesh, that Hashem can change anything at any moment, however He wants to, then it's like you don't have a God, even though you do have one, because you don't have the benefit of Eya Asher Eya. You don't have the benefit, I, I will be whatever you allow me to be, because you're nullifying and you're mitigating what I could be for you. You are living outside of the land. You're living outside of the consciousness of Amuna, Kamosh Katuv. Like the Pasuk in Tilim says, the very famous parak of Tilim 37, it's constantly dealing with Amuna. And listen to what the Pasuk says. Shechan Eret Ure Amuna. Dwell in the land, live in the land, Ure Emuna, and you will cultivate faith. You will develop Emuna. That the Pasuk in Tilim, David Amelch is teaching you that he was the Bala Muna. He was the Bala Sadeh. He was the master of the field. He was the Bala Tefila that Rabbi Nachman speaks about in his uh, Sipori Masiot, his stories. It's the Mashiach Zikenu. The Mashiach is telling you. The way to uray emuna, the way to develop and build faith, is only shechan eretz. Is only by living in the land of Israel. Meaning, only by living in the place of tefillah, only by living in the place that I truly believe that Hashem causes, renews my reality, and I pray like that. That's called living in the land. And when I live in that land, uray emuna, you're going to develop emuna. V'sham ikar aliot tefillot. And there is the place of the ascent of all tefillahs because Chazal teaches, the sages teach that it's very interesting that when a Jew prays in Chutz La'aretz, it has to be funneled first through the land of Israel, up through the place of the upper Beit HaMikdash, the spiritual Beit HaMikdash that won't be revealed until the physical one is built, to the place of the Kodesh Kadoshim. And it's only from there that prayers are actually answered. This is the reason why in the land of Israel, the sages say you must look towards the Beit HaMikdash, the, the, the direction of the Kodesh Kadoshim. However, if you live outside of the land of Israel, the sages teach that you need to look towards the land. All of these are signaling one thing. You need to be looking within yourself towards the place in which you believe mamish that Hashem is machadish, your reality, that Hashem renews your reality. That's the direction you need to be facing. And this is the depth of why, in truth, if you want to, you can face in any direction, as long as you're picturing in your mind it's Yerushalayim, it's Eretz Yisrael, because it's in that space of consciousness that the sages are telling you, you must be in before you pray. And this is the reason why it says in the Shulchan Aruch, the Jewish people, for generations, they used to spend an hour before they prayed. What are you doing for an hour before you pray? The answer is they were entering the land of Israel. And only once they entered the land did they pray from that place. 
כמו שכתוב, like it says, וסה שער השמיים. Where do we see that this is the place where tefillah elevates, that it has to first go through the land before it can elevate? So the answer is Yaakov Avinu, right? The archetypal Jew that we all come from, that we're called B'nai Yaakov, B'nai Israel. He was walking towards the land of Israel and he fell asleep. And when he fell asleep, he saw a ladder. The ladder, its head reached into Shemayim and the bottom reached into the physical world or the land, okay? Where was that ladder? It was where the Beit HaMikdash would eventually be. Where did the top reach? To where the spiritual Beit HaMikdash exists but is not being revealed until Yomot HaMashiach. And he says, this is the gate to Shemayim. Meaning, how do I reach Hashem? How do I reach Shemayim? I need the Sha'ar, I need the gate. What's the gate? Tefillah. When you pr- have Tefillah, Be'amunah Shlema, when I pray with complete Amunah, then I'm in the land of Israel. Bezret Hashem, soon, maybe even tomorrow night, we'll see uh, how my sleep goes. We're going to continue this, and we're going to see what causes us to leave the land of Israel. That it's not so much as simple as, um, if I want to be there, I can just be there. But that we're going to see that there are some vulnerabilities. And the social work world will say that a person, he has many strengths, but he also has vulnerabilities. And you need to be aware of both. So the Jewish people, we have a strength. We have a koach that we can live in the land of Israel. But we also have a tremendous vulnerability. That is that it's very easy for us to be kicked out of the land. Because the whole source for this Torah was that Rabbi Nachman had a dream of his great-grandfather, the Baal Shem Tov. And he appeared to him and he told him that whenever the Jewish people have a pagam, that they blemish Eretz Yisrael, they're thrown out of the land. So Rabbi Nachman says, what does that mean when you blemish the land? How can you blemish a physical land? And the answer is the land is emuna. When you blemish your emuna, which we're going to see in a moment how that happens, and then what happens as a result, then you're kicked out of the land meaning you're kicked out of the consciousness of belief that Hashem is controlling your life. You're thrown into Mitzrayim. You're thrown into the place of Teva, the, the, that I'm locked into nature as being my almighty God, that I believe that doctors are God, that I believe that science is God, that I believe that things can't change unless nature dictates so. And then there's a path in which I have to uh, engage in in order to leave that space. And just as a final point before we get to any questions, hopefully you guys actually heard this lesson. Um, there's a very, very famous beginning to the Torah. Rashi says something unbelievable. Rav Natan has the greatest explanation of Rashi. And it's very good eye to understand this based on what we just learned. I was thinking about it today, my Hibota dude, as I was thinking about it. I was very excited to teach this lesson. The Pasuk in the beginning of the Torah starts, Bereshi bar lokim at the Shemaim at the arts. In the beginning, Hashem created the spiritual universes and the physical world. Good. Comes Rashi to have an unbelievable point. Now we understand why it might be necessary for the Torah to start with that Hashem created the world. But for thousands of years, Jews were believers and sons of believers. The reform and the conservative movement didn't start till 200 years ago. There was no such thing except that the Jewish people believed in Hashem for thousands of years. It is only about six generations deep that there's even such a phenomenon for some people or some families or generations of a family that they don't believe in Hashem. Okay? Now, Rashi says a thousand years ago when everybody believed, why do we need the Torah to start with? Bereshit, the beginning of existence. Why do we need to start with Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov? Give me the first mitzvah. Tell me about Rosh Chodesh. We know it's the first mitzvah. The first mitzvah that was given in Mitzrayim. Hashem says, Rosh Chodesh Lachem. It's a new month for you. This is the very first mitzvah given in the Torah. Tell me that. What do I need to know about all these stories for? What am I, a child? I need a story time? That we need to spend the whole first portion of the year learning about Children's stories, just tell me the first mitzvah. I want to know what to do. Lamais, tell me what to do. Rashi comes, he brings a pasuk from Tilim. And the essence of the pasuk, he says, is like this. That if a person, the reason why it starts with Bereshit, is to give you belief that Hashem created the world, because if Hashem created the world, then He is the Melech. Then He decides what happens here. And if He decides what happens here, Rashi says there, then if a person comes to you and says the Jewish people 
should not have the land of Israel. It's not our inheritance. It's not ours. Why? Because he says that the non-Jewish people are going to tell you that other people had it first, which is very interesting because the same thing now, thousands of years later, that right now the BDS and uh, all of these different movements are trying to say, and it's true. And by the way, this is very deep for anybody who holds their argument based on this. Rashi saying, don't hold your argument on this. That Rashi says, that they're going to tell you that other people had the land before us. Just like the BDS is going to say that the Islamic nation had it before us. And just like they could have said thousands of years ago that the Canaanites had it before us. And the seven nations, the Torah says explicitly had it before us. So if they come and said the land was us for ours first, where's your claim to the land of Israel? How can you say it's yours? So Rashi says something fascinating. He says, don't say it's ours because we had it first. That's not true. Tell them that Hashem created the universe. And because Hashem created the universe, He dictates reality. Hashem gave it first to you, and He's decided now to give it to us. Okay, very nice. That's why the Torah starts like this. Rav Natan comes and says something unbelievable, which fits in with this Torah completely. Rav Natan says, is a non-Jew going to believe you? Or is a secular Jew going to believe you? You're going to come to him and tell him, Hashem created the world. It was ours first. It was ours. Sorry, it's ours because Hashem created the world. He gave the land of Israel to someone else, and now he's giving it to us. Who cares? That person's not going to believe you. That non Jew's not going to believe you. That's, as you can see, by the many, many times that this effort has been tried to be proven this way, evidence proves to the contrary. So Rav Natan says that what Rashi is saying is very deep. He's not telling you that Hashem created the world, that he gave the land to someone else, and now he's giving it to the Jewish people. So you should convince somebody else. But he's telling you that you should know. That the whole reason the Torah starts with Hashem creating the world is that you should know that Hashem created the world, that you should know that Hashem is machadish, that you should know that Hashem creates reality according to his rut zone. And just like nature had dictated that he gave the land of Israel to somebody else initially, meaning he gave a muna to the nations of the world, that he gave tefillah to the nations of the world, that he gave miracles to the nations of the world. But now he's decided to give it to you. Just in case you ever forget that this inheritance is yours for the taking. Whenever you desire it, you can go run and search for the lost princess. Whenever you want you can understand, like Rav Natan, like Rashi is teaching us, that the Torah is teaching you. Hashem created the world. Hashem created this land of Israel. Hashem created the state of Amuna. This is yours. This is your inheritance. This is your birthright. It's not a free trip to the land of Israel. It is a free trip to Hibodadut, that you can believe Mamash 100% in Akadosh Baruch Hu, that he's the creator, the orchestrator of reality. And when you believe it, you'll see it. That's why the Torah starts with Bereshi Bar Lokim at Be'aretz. This is the land of Israel, which Hashem gave as an inheritance, which he told Abraham, Lech Lecha, go to that place, go to that land. Leave behind whatever beliefs you have gotten from schools, from community, from your parents, from the secular world. And believe in me, go to the land, the place where I can be whatever you want me to be. That's the land of Israel. That's the land of milk and honey. That is the spiritual reality of the land of Israel. And this is the reason why Rabbi Nachman says later on, like Moran, every single Jew must yearn to live in the land. How can you yearn to live in the land and not live in the land? The answer is the essence of yearning to live in the land is yearning to have emunah shlema, yearning to perfect your prayer. And through this, you're going to see redemption and geula in your life. Anybody have any questions from today's lesson, the beginning of Torah Zion? We have a lot more to do. This Torah is jam-packed. There's a lot of twists and turns, and it's phenomenal. It's really something unbelievable. Um, but so far, do you have any questions? Yes, I have a question. Go ahead. So is complaining also part of uh, tefillah? Like asking Hashem? So... Rabbi Nachman says that advocating is part of tefillah. Okay, so the reason I'm making this distinction is because one of the students of Tzion who's going to be teaching Bezot Hashem very soon, he keeps having this dialogue with me, which is valid. You know, Rav Shalom Arush, who created all these garden books, he shows the greatest disdain 
and he discourages so much complaining in your prayer. You should never, ever complain. It's the cause of all your trials and tribulations. No complaining. However, this seems like a complete steer to his Rebbe, Rav Nachman, because Rav Nachman says explicitly in multiple places in the Kutumran, you must complain to Hashem. However, the way that Rebbe Nachman describes complaining to Hashem is really much more like the English word to advocate. And therefore, um, in the sense of complaining out of a lack of appreciation or a lack of feeling that, uh, that Hashem has given you what you need or what's good for you. So this Rabbi Nachman was not encouraging you to do. However, Rabbi Nachman says that when you come to pray to Hashem, you for sure need to advocate. So an example would be, um, instead of saying, Hashem, why did you make me sick? Rabbi Nachman would advocate to you, what should I do now? What can I do with this? What is the benefit of this? How can this bring me closer to you? Because Rabbi Nachman says in the first Torah of the Kutmaran that it's the essence of a Jew to need to look for the chokhmah in every situation. Look for the point in which I can get closer to Hashem through that thing. And then you'll find why Hashem did that thing. So actually I was just learning, uh, I had the schut of learning uh, with my brother-in-law. I think he's my brother-in-law. Uh, my wife's sister's husband. In Bukhari it's called Bojab. My Boja. So um, he's a really nice uh, guy. Um, I've learned a little bit of Lakuta Maran with him in the past. I asked him tonight because I put my Lakuta Halachot in to be shipped over here. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I taped it up and I need to teach it to you guys. So I asked him if he can um, go to the local bookstore and get me um, Lakuta Halachot. So he got so excited and he goes, oh my gosh. And he hugged me. He goes, oh, I want to learn this so much. He said, I'm learning this shiurim and this, this rabbi keeps referencing this book. So he picked it up tonight and we learned a piece regarding Sfirat Omer. Um, and this is the part that we learned about. It was based on the first Torah of Likud Imran. That is, that a Jew needs to constantly be looking for the chokhmah and everything. He needs to look for Hashem in everything. And Rabbi Nachman's chiddush there is, how do I look for Hashem when Hashem is infinite and I'm finite? You can only do it by, so to speak, mitzamtem, and contracting the light of Hashem. The way in which you contract the light of Hashem is the way in which, so to speak, you look at the sun. You need to put on sunglasses. So what are the sunglasses in which you can see the sun? Or what is the contracting mechanism which I use to uh, contract the light of Hashem so it's, I'm, it's palpable for me? I'm able to taste it, and it tastes good to me. He says you can only do it through the sunglasses called the muna. Only through a moon should you try to look at Hashem. So when I come to pray, I'm coming with the belief that whatever is happening to me, even if it's painful, I know that it's for my best. And then you can start to look deeply at the wisdom in whatever is taking place. That maybe, how could this be good for me? It's not good to be unhealthy. But I could say to myself, you know what? I never spoke to you before. The whole reason I'm talking to you for the first time now is because I'm sick. So all of a sudden, there's a paradigm shift. I'm only talking to you, which is the greatest source of Amuna, which is the beginning of, so to speak, a real relationship with Hashem, the beginning of living in the land of Israel, which Hashem promised us, it's my birthright. So that only happened because I'm sick. Now, all of a sudden, instead of I'm saying why, Rabbi Nachman says, say what? What should I do? So that's an example. Okay. Any other questions? So the reason why we go and do Hiboro is because we're supposed to not be sad, but we're supposed to feel heartbroken that we know that everything comes for the best. Yes, it's not to be sad. It is to pour your heart out to Hashem for a change. But Rabbi Nachman stresses very, very much, this brokenheartedness is not sadness. This is why a lot of people struggle in the beginning in their Hiboro dudes. I know for me the first couple of years and for many people, it's mom is just, uh, you know, feeling like I got the raw end of the stick and all of that feeling of resentment pouring out of me. Now on paper, this may not be the worst thing in the world because at least I'm finally getting it out. But ultimately the perfected state, which Rabbi Nachman speaking about the state of Amuna, this real state of tefillah, this perfected prayer is when we believe that whatever is taking place is for the best. And we realize at the root of it, it's only to bring me closer to him. And in truth, that's what's bringing me to that prayer right now. 
and now I can make good use of this prayer. Anybody else? Thank you, Rob. You're welcome. Any other I have questions? A question. Go ahead. Hi. Um, Hi. So I just want to ask. So does it mean basically that we're 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 allowed to pray for more? Like it's not complaining, but we can beg God to change our circumstances. Like it's 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 not a complaint, but we can ask for more. But Rabbi Nachman is saying you need to. And that's oh, a sign of a fit, and that's a sign of a muna. That if you don't, you don't really have faith. Because yeah, anybody who really believes the water, anybody who really it's okay, Benny. You're gonna teach soon, don't worry. Uh, yeah. anybody who anybody who really believes that um just put yourself on mute, Benny. Um, anybody who really believes that Hashem causes reality and gives you whatever you have, he would be crazy not to ask Hashem for more. Okay, and then what about so if, if you are crying, you're are you is that I mean, isn't that a natural reaction to someone being good. sick or okay? Crying is beautiful. So it, you still have to be thank you're thankful and you accept what Hashem gives you, but yeah, you can still ask hundred percent for change. Hundred okay, percent. Thanks. Thank you it's, so much. I, I, and I know it seems like a paradox. We've spoken many times about this, um, that Rabbi Nachman, so to speak, wants us to live in this paradoxical world that on the one hand, we have tremendous gratitude, um, almost to a default, like in an unusual way that we're grateful for everything. And on the other hand, we're begging Hashem for changes. So how can I be truly grateful and at peace with what I have and at the same time begging Hashem for a change? So this is something we've discussed many times. If Avram Aminov is still in the class right now, Last week, he spoke about Azamra. If I could give a suggestion, because he gave a chidush about this, uh, and I think it's something that the students can really benefit from. But maybe if you could teach your next class on how to, so to speak, live in both worlds and to show that it's not really a paradox, that I can be grateful and content with what I have and still beg Hashem for a change and things that I'm looking forward to. So I don't know if you're there, but that would be a good topic to speak about. Um, I am here. <laughs> Main or no or... Okay. So <laughs> just just um think that one over. I think that's a good topic. Anybody else? Right, I have a question. Um, Go ahead. Um so I heard that um Rabbi Nachman uh, was uh, when he was sick, he was trying to go city to city to find a cure. I don't know if you, how much is true. And uh... yeah, so he he wasn't trying to. His the people around him, his crew forced him to. Um, and every single time he came back from there, he would speak about how big of a waste of a time it was. And um, and it's brought down in Sikhot Duran that he was trying to bring rectifications for the medications that they were giving him because they had fallen into the area of uh, Klipot and, um, and Rabbi Nachman was rectifying the medicines. <laughs> um, so Rabbi Nachman wow. says, do not, learn, wow. Do, wow. do not learn from the fact that I'm taking medications or that I'm going to doctors. The reasons are far beyond you why I'm doing this. Um, your chiyuv, your responsibility is to turn to Hashem like I have done my whole life. It's just something that I have to do with them. It's not because I actually believe that they're going to help me. Okay. That Any other questions? If he doesn't, if, if he doesn't, if he doesn't, if he doesn't believe that he's that they're gonna help him, why did he go to them in the first place? Sometimes you do things for other people to make them happy. Sometimes you do things for your wife, even though you don't want to, because it's gonna give her. Masking. Masking. Okay. Any other questions? Well, maybe this is why the whole world is so busy yeah. with the drugs. Uh, Rabbi, so so question. So um, wait, Daniel, Daniel. Let me just see if other people have questions as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead, Jerry. Jerry, you have your hand up. Did you want to say something? You're going to text it in. 
Okay, am I unmuted now? Okay, go ahead. Can't Hashem work through a doctor? He could. He could do anything. But um, but Rabbi Nachman, uh, one of the things which was unusual about him, one of the many things, or one of the things that he stressed uh, significantly more so than other rabbis, was he was very, very, very against um, looking towards doctors for Fua um, as opposed to looking to Hashem. And it's not that the doctors can't be the, the one to give you the healing, but Rabbi Nachman explains in the Kutumran and in Sikhotaran that when you go to see a doctor, he says, spiritually, there's really only one doctor with your cure. And that one doctor who has your cure also needs it to be the right season. And he needs to have the right medication with him in order to give it over to you. So he's saying it's like a needle in a haystack in terms of actually finding the doctor that you need. And so then what's happening to you with every doctor that you see that's not that doctor? So he says tremendous uh, possible damage, not just uh, spiritually, but actually physically, because anybody who takes medication knows that if you don't take the right one, um, there's a lot of side effects from medications. And therefore, Rabbi Nachman says that if you go see doctors, so you have to find the right one. And for that, you need a very big scoot and you need to be in the right place in the right time. But if you go to Hashem, so he's good for everything at every time. Also, the doctor himself has to know that the Rufuwa is coming from Hashem. And if you don't go sure. to that type of a doctor, then... Damn, you're in some big... You, the doctor needs a doctor. Benny's going to be your doctor. Interesting. Rambam and Ram, Ramban were both doctors, right? That's right. Rebbe Nachman was very... Uh, uh, the, you could see it, it, first of all, when it came to the Ramban, he was very different than the Rambam in his perspectives. It was much more leaning towards Rebbe Nachman's teachings. Rebbe Nachman has many uh, perspectives which contradict directly the Rambam, uh, his teachings and uh, the things which she encouraged. So, um, But theoretically, you're saying if you use a Muna and you use it, Bodhidut, and you say, look, I need a doctor, lead me to the right person and, uh, you know, have it work out for me. You could do that. You could do that. But Rabbi Nachman's saying instead that Hashem says in a pasuk, Anirofe, this month of ER is actually an acronym for I am Hashem, your doctor. That's what this month means, that there's a special mm -hmm. healing that comes in this specific month. So what is the essence of I am Hashem, your doctor? That means that if you allow me to be your doctor, then why would you want to be at the um, behest of human authority and human fallibility when I am Hashem, your doctor? Okay. So, you know, Rabbi Nachman yeah. was very, he spoke in uh, very derogatory terms. I'm not going to get into it now because I know it's going to bring up a, a whole reaction from the Olam, but there is going to be a time and place that we're going to speak about Rabbi Nachman's views on medicine. He was very, very, very against uh, Jews' first inclination to be to go get help from a doctor as opposed to looking towards Hashem for why the problem is taking place and the healing from the problem itself. That's not to say that there's no place for medicine and there's no place for doctors. But it was this, so to speak, this, um, this leaning on the medical community of the Jewish people that Rabbi Nachman was so against yeah. because he felt it went against the fiber of faith and yeah. what, what faith really means, which is that Hashem is the cause of the illness and Hashem is, um, his whole thing is, his whole essential being, our God, is that he changes nature for us. You know, I know that the Lubavitcher Rebbe, I met his personal doctor a few times and I mean, he used him, and he, you know, he, he. Uh, uh, also, you know. Rabbi Nachman had very different perspectives than the Lubavitcher Rebbe as well, uh, which okay. is yeah. So Rabbi Nachman's uh, teachings are unique. His perspectives are unique. There was many things that he felt either differently or at least much stronger about than other Hasidic masters. Um, this is not to nullify those beliefs. You know, everybody has to look down deep. But, you know, part of having the Rebbe or any Rebbe is to um, be full force in your conviction of what they believe. So if you're a Chabad Chassid and you're a Chassid of Lubavitcher Rebbe, then you take his beliefs and you go all the way with it. And that's where the blessing comes. 
The same thing by Rabbi Nachman. His whole system of Amuna is organic and it's and it's uh, thorough and it f- and it flows into every state of your life. And one of those is your approach to doctors and medication. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome, Jerry. Thank you for enough time is from what I'm understanding. There's the right way, and then there's the easy way. Any other questions? A question for you. Bye-bye. Go ahead. How are you doing? Great, thank God. How are you? Good, good. I miss you already. I miss you too. A uh, quick question for you. At that moment, when there is a, a situation, a confrontation, anger, at that moment, you can't really do able to do it. What do you say? You talk to Hashem, Hashem, why did you put me into the situation? Or what can I get from the situation? What do I say at that moment to kind of reflect and understand how to deal with the situation? You could say, Hashem, why am I getting angry? And if you look very deeply, Rabbi Nachman teaches anger only comes when Amuna is not there. Meaning the reason why I'm getting angry is because I believe that a person is causing what's taking place and not Hashem. That's the cause of anger. You know, when do I get angry with my wife? Uh, when I feel like she wronged me. But if we understand that she doesn't do anything Hashem doesn't want her to do. So my problem's with Hashem, it's not with her. And then I wouldn't be getting angry at her. You know, how does it that Rambam says that with every emotional quality, he says that you need to take the middle line. You need to be very, very uh, conservative. You don't need to be uh, crazy, fanatical. Uh, you shouldn't always do this or never do this. The Rambam says explicitly, but he says when it comes to anger, you need to go all the way away. No such thing. It doesn't exist. How can you codify in Jewish law that a Jew shouldn't get angry? How, how is there even such a uh, hava mina to have a law like that? And the answer is very deep. The answer is that when a Jew has a muna, there's no such thing as anger. Beautiful. So at that moment, I could say, Hashem, please don't let me get ma- angry. Can I also do it like a hit board to say, to say that I don't want to get angry? 100%. Get all angry. the time. I do this all the time. Sometimes I'm coming back home and I had a long day. And before I go back into the house, I literally say to Hashem, Hashem, please. I know my day was difficult. I'm drained right now. But my wife needs a husband. My, my kids need a father. They didn't see me all day. Hashem, please help me to have the conviction, the patience, the faith, the strength to go into the house right now with a big smile and uh, to give them the same thing that I gave my students and the same thing that I gave my studies. But I, I need that, you know, the ultimately um, the more you believe in Hashem, the more you're going to speak to him in every different type of situation. And Rabbi Nachman says, whenever you feel any type of inspiration to talk to Hashem, do not miss that moment because you're not going to have it again. Amazing, beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Hi, Rabbi. I put a few questions on the chat. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Uh, let's go back a little bit. When, we, when do we ask Hashem for things and when do we thank Him for our current situation? You do both. For example, someone that's single, do we thank him for being single or do we ask him for Hashem to bring our zivuk? So that's so the answer is both. Rabbi Nachman explains in the third Torah of the Kutum Aran that you need to become a master of both. You start by thanking Hashem for being single. And when you really, really believe it's from Hashem and you believe it's for the best and you have simcha from the fact that you're single, even though uh, it's not what you initially wanted, but why do you want what you want? Because you want it to be good. And what's good? Really what Hashem wants, you know, that's the best. And then from that place, though, you understand that the Torah says, Hashem wants you uh, to find your zivuk. So then you could say, Hashem, I'm thankful that you put me in this situation because I know this is the best for me, even though it's painful. But Hashem, please, you say in your own Torah, you want me to get married. So do it for you. Do it for your sake. And now all of a sudden, my orientation towards my desires becomes much more selfless. And they have, your words have much more grace. You know, if I uh, say Hashem, or if I say, let's say, for instance, uh, after this class is over, I go ask somebody in the house, can I have 400 shekels? What do you need it for? I want to go get high. So those words are not going to have grace, right? 
But if I say I want those 400 shekels so I can buy you a gift that you can't get, but I know where to get it. Now, all of a sudden, you can't wait to give me the 400 shekels. So this is an approach that uh, I use and I highly encourage. And you throw it back to Hashem. That uh, Hashem, you know, like for instance, there was a story of Rav Levi or Berdichev. He saw He sees a person and he's running and he's sweating and he's going from place to place. And Rav Levi goes to him and he says to him, uh, where are you running to? And he said, I'm running after money. And he said to him, that's not your job. He said, your job is to connect to Hashem. It's Hashem's job to give you money. So what was the, what's the power? What's the, what's the hop here? He's saying, you have it all wrong. Your efforts have to be in doing what Hashem wants. It's Hashem's job to give you money. So don't go from place to place going crazy. Go scream to Hashem, Hashem, you need to give me money. I need money from you. If you want me to spend time learning, if you want me to spend time helping other Jewish people, if you want me to spend time praying, so where am I going to support myself from? You're going to need to do it. So this Hashem loves. But if it's coming from complaint, Hashem, you didn't give me enough. I don't have that big mansion that I wanted. I don't have that uh, whatever that I wanted. Why did you want all of those things? For superficial reasons. So those words aren't going to have as much grace or as much chain. They're not going to find as much favor for Hashem because they're selfish. But if the whole reason why I want to do something is originating in something which is selfless, so Hashem loves that prayer. Okay, let's see if there's another question here. So what kind of miracle are you not allowed to ask for? Or do we need to believe in them first in order for them to be okay to ask for? You can ask for any miracle you want. Rabbi Nachman says you should ask for every miracle you want. And you should not wait to believe in the miracle. You should do it even without because Rabbi Nachman says the asking itself causes belief. And on top of that, a great thing to pray for, the first miracle you should ask for is to believe in Hashem. Hashem, help me to believe in miracles. That's a great miracle. That's the best miracle. Because if you believe in that, then every other miracle becomes easy. There's another question here. Is a sh Does that mean if we're not in Israel, that even if we can merit something to happen, there's a chance it won't happen because we're not in Israel and can't reach 100% faith? It's Mashma from Rabbi Nachman that there are limits to a person's ability to experience things outside of the land. Um, Rabbi Nachman says that for a person to reach their spiritual potential in another Torah in Lukut Moran, he says it's only possible in the land of Israel. So for sure, whether it comes to faith or it comes to any madrega of spirituality, your highest ones are here. Um, now, obviously, to be able to get to the land of Israel itself, you need to have a very high degree of moon, a very high degree of faith, because the land itself is not as accom <coughs> accommodating in a lot of ways that we're used to. And so to speak, uh, only ones who have tremendous amounts of faith get to the land itself. Um, but then once you get here, Rabbi Nachman says the whole essence of the land is that you're able to reach the highest madrigas, levels of spirituality. So it's clear from Rabbi Nachman, it's clear from the Orachayim, it's clear from the Hasidic masters and the Mukabalim that the highest levels of spirituality are only accessible to a Jew in the land of Israel. Um, it says that there's 10 levels of Kedusha in the world. Nine of them were given to the land of Israel. It says that there's 10 levels of spiritual, uh, of beauty in the world. Nine of them were given to Yerushalayim. And there's many other statements like this. And obviously we're learning from this Torah that all prayers go up first in the land of Israel and that all other prayers have to be funneled through outside of the land to the land. So if you're going to say, so who cares? It's going to eventually get to the land. The answer is that there are negative forces in the world which exist. Um, very strongly in Chutzla Arts, their whole desire is to interfere with your prayer going, uh, and therefore um, your prayers have to hit some um, resistance before they get to the land and go up. So uh, it, it makes it more difficult. And that's why Rabbi Nachman says that every single Jew needs to yearn to live here, because your ability to cap out spiritually, which Rabbi Nachman was convinced is the purpose of your life, uh, that can only happen here. So you must yearn to live there. Now, obviously, we're learning that really, when are you going to be in the physical end of Israel when you develop a certain level of amuna? 
because the physical land is really just a manifestation of your level of amuna. When you reach a certain level of amuna, Rabbi Nachman saying that's called living in the land of Israel, and so to speak, you're transported here. You automatically live in the land. Um, someone said, Thank is you. a shul in the USA considered the land of Israel? If the shul in the USA, everyone in that shul is praying uh, with tremendous fervor and koach, with emuna shlema, with belief that Hashem is machadesh, then for sure that, that shu is the land of Israel. Okay. Did that answer all your questions? Hopefully that person's still there. Um, any other final questions before we end up from new people? Thank you so much, Rabbi. That was great. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, everybody. Have an amazing... Uh, I guess it's going to be nighttime. You guys are going to sleep now. Everybody have an amazing day tomorrow. Uh, Lagba Omer is coming up soon. I hope to Bezrat Hashem have another class with you before that. Uh, if not, have an amazing, amazing Lagba Omer. And uh, this is a time of tremendous joy, tremendous simcha. We know that Rabbi Nachman uh, implied very, very much that he was a reincarnation of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. This is implied as well in the gematria of uh, Shimon Bar Yochai being the same exact numerical value as Shimon, I mean, sorry, as Nachman Ben Simcha, meaning that their names have the same exact numerical value. And Rabbi Nachman felt that it was his mission, just like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, that he should reveal Torah um, and to bring us to a state of Geula, even though maybe the rest of the world isn't holding in that place. Um, just like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, that the Torah is never going to be forgotten, even though all the sages said that it would. So to Rabbi Nachman, uh, it, it appears that he felt that it was his mission as well to bring the Geula. Um, so when Lagba Omer comes up and we're able to listen to music and to get haircuts, you know, just have in mind that the Geula is going to come in the merit of the teachings of the Zohar and the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh. Uh, when those teachings go chutzah, and Bezrat Hashem Tzion is going to be a part of that. And every student here, both in um, bringing these teachings within yourself primarily and then giving it out to others, uh, that hopefully Tzion is going to be one of the primary uh, reasons for the redemption. And um, to make these teachings go chutza and to, to bring the Geula Beschut, Rabbi Shrimbo Yochai, Rabbi Nachman Fega. And Beschut us, you know, Rabbi Nachman says that every single one of my students is going to have a story written about them. So Bezrat Hashem, we're going to write our stories now. And all those stories are going to contribute to the Geula Shlema, the final Geula. Bezrat Hashem, we should see it. Everybody have an amazing, amazing night and amazing day. Have a good night, Rabbi.